So hello, my, my name is Michael Unzer. I'm a professor at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. And first, I'd like to thank very much uh, the organizers for the invitation. And I'm <clears throat> very sorry that we couldn't really go to Finland this time and hoping forward to another uh, opportunity. But anyway, so let me start by sharing the slides with you. For those who know me, uh, I've been like using splines quite a lot uh, for during my career for doing signal processing. And now the re uh, more recent tendency is machine learning and deep neural networks. And so in this talk, what I really want to show you that splines are very relevant as well uh, for both uh, classical methods in machine learning as well as deep neural networks. <clears throat> So my background is really biomedical imaging where we are dealing with inverse problems. And so we are collecting measurements of some unknown object here that's corrupted by noise. And there's also like a, <clears throat> a, a linear system which re represents the imaging physics. And the problem so is to recover uh, the unknown uh, S here. For example, here, uh, the output could be uh, blurred images and you want to uh, recover uh, density of fluorophores. And uh, so the way we like to set this kind of problem is for an optimization task where we <clears throat> will uh, uh, first uh, try to minimize a measure of consistency between our reconstruction and, and the measurements. And because the problem is ill-posed, we are usually <clears throat> adding some regularization. And so that has to favor solutions that are, for example, uh, smooth or sparse. And, and so here L is like a differential operator, like the gradient. And we're using a P2 norm classically in the 20th century, which yields linear algorithm or a L1 norm like in compressed sensing. <clears throat> now, the link with uh, learning, supervised learning is actually supervised learning is also a inverse problem, also a linear inverse problem, but the main difference is that it's infinite dimensional. Uh, so think of the problem as follows. Uh, so we are given some uh, inputs, uh, let's say uh, examples of vectors, patterns, and uh, YM would be the desired output. And so we're trying now to learn a function which will map here the domain of the inputs of you know, n dimensional vector into R, which is this Y. And so we want to learn this function such that at least on the example we gave that <clears throat> f of x, y is equal to or close uh, uh, to y, m uh, without overfitting. And since this is ill-posed, so people early on in machine learning, uh, Poggio, for instance, so they introduced also the uh, <clears throat> uh, concept of regularization and trying now to favor solution such a, a certain energy is not too large. And this energy here is given by an operator applied to the function. You're squaring all that and, and, and here summing over the domain now, which is an integral because we're in the continuum. And then you can solve your, uh, formulate your problem as follows. So you, you, you want <clears throat> to ensure some consistency between here, uh, uh, you, you know, the, your, your learner and, and, and <clears throat> you know, with respect to your training data. And then you are looking for the solution that uh, subject to this constraint will minimize your regularization function. And with uh, uh, Lagrange multipliers, you can reset that in, in this more familiar form. And now if uh, this R of F now corresponds to a Hilbertian norm associated to reproducing kernel Hilbert space, in that case, uh, you, you, you can really solve uh, the problem in closed form. And in fact, what you obtain is a linear combination of kernels and this is very much the foundation of all the kernel methods of classical machine learning, including uh, uh, support vector machines. <clears throat> but now uh, let's try to revisit a little the problem and let's start with an example. So we are, we're having those data points here. And so you want to learn the map of y equal f of x. So how can we do? So we can apply a variety of algorithms. And so here's the output of uh, all those algorithms. Now let's start by uh, those here, which are the classical ones. So this is a uh, kernel methods of, of uh, classical 
machine learning here, an expansion that uses Gaussian kernels. Now, if you use the kernels to be narrow, you'll fit the data well, but when you have a gap here, uh, this, uh, I mean, the, 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 the solution here will have this sort of artificial drop. Now, if you use a larger Gaussian kernel, you can sort of compensate for that, but at the expense of some ringing <coughs> and uh, also smoothing. Now, this is the classical linear spline solution, uh, which dates back uh, 70 years, and it's <coughs> kind of okay, satisfactory for that kind of problem. So now, the, the methods that uh, I, I want to emphasize today uh, also are, are those here, and uh, uh, I mean, only this one has a quadratic uh, regularization. All the others have non-quadratic regularization. Now, what's uh, so, sort of remarkable here is all solutions here are splines. Okay, I'm a spline guy. Uh, I mean, this one is kind of j uh, 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 jaggy, and and because we're minimizing uh, the the Lipschitz constant, and so that's uh, you, know, <clears throat> you, you know a rel relatively permissive norm. Um, I tend to prefer this one, and I'll, I'll tell you more about it. And this one is supported by very solid mathematics. And of course, uh, if you are a neural network person, if you uh, uh, apply a neural network, you, you get that solution. What's remarkable, those two are very much the same. And in fact, I'll show you that uh, neural network also give you splines. And, and so now what I'll present to you is the mathematics that underlie all those methods. <laughs> and also some uh, explanation why those neural networks actually uh, uh, give very similar solutions. <clears throat> okay, so this is really what we're going to concentrate on. So, but now uh, I told you this requires some mathematics. And in fact, uh, this uh, relies on functional optimization. And there uh, one needs a, a sort of a higher level framework. And I will introduce to you a, a unifying representer theorem. So please bear with me because I've been working on, on spline functional optimization for many years. And by really thinking of it, now I came to a much more sort of high level understanding and surprisingly it makes the whole thing much easier. And then I, I'll show you how this uh, new uh, representer theorem you can actually use to uh, uh, derive all classical techniques of machine learning and uh, including the solution I showed you uh, <clears throat> on the left. And, and finally, I'll make the link with neural networks and I'll show you there how also with neural networks we can invoke some functional optimization techniques. Now, uh, we need Banach spaces. Okay, so what's a Banach space? Uh, you all know what's a vector space, you all know what's a norm. So what, what is there more with Banach spaces? Usually they go with infinite dimensions. In infinite dimension, you have this problem that you can consider things that are converging to a limit. And it may happen that the limit could be outside of the space, which doesn't happen in finite dimensions. So Banach spaces are really complete norm spaces that meaning that all the limits of, of uh, convergence sequence in the norms are also part of the space. Now it's a very general concept. So it covers of course, uh, linear algebra, uh, but also function spaces, which are more relevant to machine learning. And if you actually, if you look at machine learning, it's more like going from RD to RN, <clears throat> like a neural network. So where the output is also multidimensional. But now uh, from a more abstract perspective, we can also have spaces of linear functionals. And if we want to be really general, actually we could have linear spaces of bounded uh, operators from one Banach space to another one. So you see oh, it's almost circular, but here, this Banach space here, uh, uh, the domain here can be something much more general than RD, so it can actually be a, a function space as well as the output. And so that could, for example, represent matrices. <clears throat> now, uh, we will rely on theory of duality. <clears throat> and so this uh, dual of a Banach space is unique. <clears throat> and here uh, re represented with this prime symbol and now what, what is it? It's really a space of linear function. So what is a linear function? So it's something that's linear. So you know what's a linear operation. And so it's a, it's a linear operation that takes as input an element of this space X and will return a real number, okay? 
And now uh, the ones that form this dual space are the ones that are continuous on, on X. So that means it's, we are only interested in the linear function such that if you do a little perturbation on the input, you also have only a little perturbation on the output. And we are representing that by this uh, bracket notation, which is, uh, reminds us of an inner product, but it's really a duality product. And then uh, actually the Banach space, dual Banach space <clears throat> is unique and equipped with this dual norm that has this definition. And, and so you see it, we are looking at all possible actions of uh, G over F and normalizing with respect to the norm of F and looking for the supremum. And this supremum will give us the norm of the uh, dual space. Now, if you look at this equation, now just, uh, it's quite obvious that, uh, I mean, this side here is large or equal to this side here without the supremum, okay? And so that gives us this inequality here so that actually, so the action of G on F absolute value has to be smaller or equal to actually the norm of G and, uh, multiplied by the norm of F. So norm of G uh, given by that. And of course, this is sharp because of, of this, the supremum. Now, uh, some examples. So the LP spaces of uh, functional analysis, you know that the duals are also LP prime spaces uh, with this uh, conjugate relation between exponents. And for example, if you take P equal two, you get L2 and the dual of L2 is L2. And now this goes, this duality inequality then uh, gives us actually Holder inequality. But this is super general. In fact, every Banach space has this sort of Hölder-like inequality. <clears throat> or uh, for example, in the case of Hilbert spaces, this is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And that gets me now to risk conjugates. And, and so if you write the duality bound uh, for Hilbert spaces, I, I just told you it's equivalent to the Cauchy-Schwarz, then you get this, okay? So, you take an element of a Hilbert space, an element of the dual, so that's a linear functional. And then, okay, now you have the action of the linear functional here, so uh, absolute value, so that's a real number, uh, will be smaller or equal than the product of the norms of here in this Hilbert space and here in the dual. And then what the risk defines, it tries to find the mapping between the Hilbert space and this dual and it identifies the most interesting element in the other space as the risk conjugate. And it's, it is the guy that if you apply it to U, it will return actually the squared norm of U. And it will also be such that it makes the duality <coughs> uh, inequality sharp. And actually the fact that you make the inequality sharp, this is only possible if actually the norm of this U star in, in this dual Hilbert space is equal to the norm of u. So you have a norm preservation. And then it can be shown that this mapping between u and its conjugate is actually linear and invertible. And, uh, and so it's actually invertible in such a way that if you take the Hilbert conjugate of u, and now you're in the new Hilbert space, and you take again the Hilbert conjugate, but with respect to the new Hilbert space, you go back to the initial Hilbert space. And it's linear, so if you take, you know, consider sum of two elements, do the uh, conjugate, it also distributes like that. And in fact, the fact that it's reversible has also to do with reflexibility because uh, uh, a Hil uh, space is reflexive. So if you take the conjugate of the conjugates of the dual space and you're back into the space. Now, uh, this whole thing is that it can be extended for Banach spaces, uh, this uh, thing of uh, conjugates. And uh, so if you have now a pair of dual Banach spaces, and I, I told you if you specify X, X prime is, is unique, then uh, you will say that an element F star of the dual space is a conjugate uh, or, or together with F form a conjugate pair if they have the same norm. So exactly as in the risk story. And if now this inequality or actually, if the inner product or, or the duality product between those two guys actually uh, uh, saturates uh, the duality inequality, you get a sharp duality bound. Now, 
What's a little different as in the Hilbert space setting is that you, if you take an F in the Banach space, you don't necessarily have a unique conjugate. You could have a whole set. And, and so the whole set defines the duality mapping. But there are very interesting cases. For example, when the space X prime is strictly convex, in that case, there's only always a single uh, a conjugate. And in this way, in this uh, uh, instance here, you define the duality operator that is now a, in general nonlinear operator, but that will for every element identify a corresponding element in the, in the dual space. Now, this concept here was introduced by Berling, so it's not a, a Finnish mathematician, but not too far. So he's a very, maybe the most famous or one of the most famous Norwegian mathematician, and he's very famous not only for his math, but because he deciphered the secret code of the Germans uh, during Second World War, which, you know, helped a lot the Allies. Now, what are the properties of duality mapping? Um, so, as I said, every element of a, Hil uh, of a Banach space has a conjugate, at least one, and if there are more, uh, the set of conjugate is a convex set and it's closed, we start closed. And now the duality mapping is single uh, valued. This means there's all, uh, you know, one to one correspondence if the space is strictly convex. And here's the definition of strict convexity for uh, uh, Banach space and we'll come to it a, a little later. Reflexive, I already told you about. Okay. I mean, this gives me very uh, general framework, but uh, the thing was to try to specify a very general result for functional optimization. And I call this the mother of all representer theorem. So that you know, originated in Lausanne Christmas 2018. And so we're trying to minimize this. So, so what is this? Okay, you have Y and now new F are like linear measurements that you're extracting from, from F. And so this new here is, a, is an operator that goes from X prime. So that's the space over which we're minimizing into RM. So we are extracting like M measurements. And um, now this new here, now we have one assumption so that the new must be element of X. And so that implies in fact that uh, <clears throat> this measurement uh, operator is continuous. And so that's a very weak assumption, but otherwise you can do any mathematics. So essentially it means this theorem is, it will always be, uh, I mean, there, there are almost no other assumptions. Now, what is this E? So it's a, uh, it's a function that measures proximity between Y and new F. It's convex, strictly convex. And, and this here we have the regularization, which is given by the norm in the Hilbert uh, Banach space. And here we can, uh, if we want, also ap uh, apply some <clears throat> non -in uh, increasing function, like, like uh, for example, the pth power. And here's the theorem. So, general representer theorem. Uh, bear with me, it looks a little abstract, but you'll see it will be so powerful because we were going to, uh, you know get all kinds of very interesting results uh, of known and not so known uh, uh, optimization problems. So first of all, it tells us uh, uh, the solution set is non-empty uh, and, and, and convex. So it means the solution exists. But then it also says that all solutions here are x, y conjugates of a common new zero. And now this is very important because there's somehow a new zero that we don't know yet. So it's someone who lives in the span of the measurement function. We like to represent it like that. So there's a guy here in the span of the measurement functionals. And you know, like all the solutions that are in a, a convex set here actually are, uh, are Banach conjugates of this guy here. Okay, so which is quite of, uh, I mean, it puts lots of structure in the problem. But that's a little abstract. So now the parametric form of the solution will depend on the type of space. Now, if X prime is a Hilbert space and phi is strictly convex, then the solution is unique. Okay, so there's a single point up there and it admit, admits a linear expansion with coefficients i a m. So that's really remarkable. It means the solution 
lives in a, in a linear subspace of dimension M spanned by some basis function, and we know the basis function. If I, the basis function I just obtained by taking this duality map in the Hilbert space, so it, it is the risk map of those new, uh, new M, which are the, the measurement functionals. So it's, for, for example, for machine learning, it's Dirac's. Uh, if you do uh, uh, MRI, it may be like Fourier <coughs> type of inner products. Okay, so that's in the case of Hilbert space. Now, if you have a Banach space, a strictly convex Banach space, <clears throat> it's almost the same thing, uh, except it becomes nonlinear. So you have this new guy here, and you have the duality mapping, and you have a single guy here because it's unique, and this can be represented like that. So it means the F0 now will be uh, some nonlinear mapping of uh, a function here that lives in a finite dimensional space. So that really means that the manifold of possible solutions is really in a very low dimensional manifold, and we know actually the form of the manifold. So, so that essentially gives us you know, you know, where to search for, for the solution. And now the third case, <clears throat> and so that's the most challenging one, when X prime is not strictly convex, then unfortunately we don't have a, a, a unique solution anymore, necessarily. Then we have a kind of convex set of solution but the convex set has those very uh, important points here, which I call extreme points. And now the amazing thing is that we have a way of representing the extreme points. And the extreme points now have also a linear expansion in terms of some basis function. But now what's really remarkable, those EKs, which are the atoms, in fact, they are adaptive, okay? And those atoms are taking within a collection of guys, which are the extreme points of the unit ball of the Banach space. Okay, looks a little abstract, but uh, it would become clear. So now what we need is a definition of extreme points. So, so here is a convex set. And now what is an extreme point? So as I said, it's those guys here. So it's any guy that's somehow at the corner because you cannot say it's in between two other points. Like it's not on the straight line that connects any other two points inside uh, the convex set. Now extreme points examples, and I think there it will ring a bell. Okay, so those are the uh, uh, unit balls of all the LP norms. Let's start with L infinite. Okay, L infinite here is the unit ball, so it's uh, actually unit a rectangle and I mean the extreme points are those corners here and, and those are vectors uh, whose coordinates are either one or all corners are either one or minus one. <clears throat> okay so it's kind of extreme vectors okay can only take one but uh, changing the sign and then the next one that's uh, very important for compressed sensing so it's this guy so that's the unit ball of L1 norm so it's a polytope and you all know that the extreme points now are those uh, points in purple and those are sparse vectors. Okay, so there are vectors that has, have a, only one, a, a one at one of the coordinates and all the others are zero. And now you may wonder, okay, what are the extreme points of the other balls? And in fact, here it's uh, much less interesting because actually every point is an extreme point. And in fact, if you go back to the definition of strict convexity of a Banach space, uh, actually being strictly convex is equivalent to saying that all boundary points are extreme. So I would say that the third part of the theorem here is absolutely non-informative for uh, strictly convex. Uh, and it, 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 it just, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it will really be interesting in the case of non-strictly convex. And when, in fact, you, you have a only a minority of points on the boundary that are uh, extreme points. Okay, <clears throat> so those, this was very, very ma uh, abstract math, but okay, let's try to <clears throat> relate that to something concrete, uh, a modern re regularization technique. So first start with learning in uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So you may have uh, heard that term and you wonder what, what is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So a very brief definition is any Hilbert space where you can sample functions. 
And what, what does it mean exactly? It means that actually, usually you sample in signal processing by doing an inner product with a Dirac, okay? At the position X0 where you sample. So you want those Dirac shifted by X0 to be part of the dual space. And, the, and, and then that defines actually <clears throat> what's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And then what is uh, the reproducing kernel? It's just the, the Hilbert conjugate of those guys, okay? Indexed by X0 and the free variable here. That's it. So now what's the learning problem? Okay, as I said in the introduction, given X and Y, you want to find the function. So you want to minimize that. You have a now additive uh, uh, loss here where you're looking at the difference between, uh, uh, penalizing the difference between YM and here the sampling of this function here and your regularization involving <clears throat> the norm of the Hilbert space. Now this is a special case of the uh, representer theorem because X now is X, uh, H prime and now you need X prime so it will be uh, H prime prime which in fact is H because you are reflexive. Now in, in the case of machine learning the news here are very specific they're just Dirac's because we're just taking the value of the function at some positions. So that's very specific to machine learning. And then we can apply the theorem. And so what's important here that we know this risk map. And now the risk map I told you is a linear operator that goes from the dual space to the space. And since those are spaces of functions, any linear operator in fact is characterized by a kernel. So Schwarz kernel of the operator is so it's the infinite dimensional analog of the matrix. <clears throat> and in fact, the basis function that will enter uh, the, in, in the formulation of the theorem now are just the risk map of those Dirac's. Okay, and so, you know, like applying the operator to a shifted Dirac, actually this gives us generalized impulse response of the operator. And, and so there, here you get your expansion here as a linear combination of basis function, but actually the basis function are the impulse response of the risk map. Okay, now there are two entries, the dot here, which is the free variable. So it's the variable of your function X, uh, F. And now here it's just sampled. Uh, I mean, you have just a finite number basis function where you fix the second variable at the location of the data points. Now, in practice, people actually prefer to do regularization with a linear shifting variant uh, operator, and that will really relate to the kernel methods of machine learning. And for example, Tikhonov uh, of the type used by uh, Poggio Girosi. Uh, so in this case, uh, you, you have this norm here that involves an operator and the L2 norm. So what, what is the assumption? We want L to be linear shift invariant, like in uh, linear system theory. So that means a convolution operator, but we want it also to be in invertible. So that's super important here. And then if it's a convolution operator, we can characterize by the frequency response. And now here's more or less uh, the sort of higher level view. Okay, we have our Hilbert space. And now if we apply L to the functions, we are supposed to end up in L2. Okay, so we have an isomorphism here between H and L2, and we are going over by L. And then we can go over this way by applying L minus one because the operator is invertible. Now, key observation of the reproducing kernel. Now, I, I've also given you how you go from L2 to the dual space, okay? And here you can just trust me. Here you apply the adjoint operator and here the uh, uh, inverse adjoint operator, okay? So uh, the risk map is the operator from going from H prime to H. So if we look at it, it's first applying L minus one star followed by L minus one. So it's what's done here. And so that's actually the inverse of that operator. But now L, you know, is linear shift invariant. So therefore I can compute the impulse response of, those guy, of this guy by, uh, because I know this guy is a convolution operator, I can just compute its impulse response by now uh, in the Fourier domain. So the inverse is one over and you know LL star here will just put uh, the uh, um, 
frequency response star uh, uh, squared. And so that gives me then the, the parametric form of the solution, which is actually an expansion of kernels. Okay, those guys here, in fact, they will just be the impulse response of the risk map. Oops, sorry. Positioned at the data point. So you, you have a sum of kernels positioned on the data points. And now, for example, for the traditional methods and the first algorithm I showed you, one uses uh, Gaussian kernels. And, and so that gives you the traditional algorithms. But now let's make the link with splines. So splines is almost the same thing. Uh, so this is the traditional spline. So they are 70 years old almost. And uh, in this case, the regularization operator is the derivative and the L2 norm. Now there's a problem here because I said the operator should be invertible. Now the derivative is almost invertible except that it has a null space. So, so, you know, up to a constant. And so therefore you really need to factor out uh, the constants. But it's just a, a subspace of dimension one in infinite dimension, so that can be done. And that gives you like a direct sum topology. Anyway, at that stage, then what you do is essentially the same as before. So you have L, uh, uh, you know, uh, L, L star here minus one. And uh, now you all know the derivative is J omega. So one of, uh, 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 you know, uh, and the things, uh, you know, composed with the adjoint. So it's one over omega square. In this Fourier transform, if you look in the table, you get one, uh, one half of x. And then you can apply the theorem more, more or less as it is. So linear combination of basis function, which are shifted version of this absolute value of x shifted by xm on the data point. But now you have this term here that corresponds to the null space. And this term is very important because it's not penalized anyway. If you apply, uh, if you look at the solution, you get exactly the smoothing spline. Uh, now this is piecewise linear. Now the catch is just there are as many pieces at their data points. Okay, so it's not particularly uh, economical, but it nicely fits through the data. <clears throat> Oops. I want <clears throat> now we say okay, we want now to do a sparse kernel expansions. Now maybe of you know, if you know of compressed sensing, you say, oh, easy. We replace the L2 norm by L1 norm. And same story, linear shift invariant, invertible regularization operator. We have frequency response. And then uh, same as before, we have a Banach isometry between L1 and this new space. We can go like that. So, okay, this looks good in principle, but there's a huge problem, actually a theoretical roadblock here is we cannot apply uh, our theorem because in fact, uh, <clears throat> there doesn't exist a, a, a pre-dual space X such that L1 is actually the dual of something. And so that means that the optimization problem <clears throat> is ill-posed and does not admit the solution. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, if you look at it in, in, in details, because somehow it, it converges to a limit, but the limit is outside the space. Okay, but then you can go again and look at mathematics and that turns out to be a, a solution. And the solution uh, is, is finding the proper continuous counterpart of L1 norm. Now, if you look at the L1 norm in finite dimension, you know it's, the, it's actually the dual of the L infinite norm. You have this thing here and you can apply the theory without any problem. But now the problem, if you do it in infinite dimension, you cannot just put here L infinite uh, function. It doesn't work you have to be a little careful and you have to impose that your functions be continuous. I mean, bounded, that's L infinite and decaying at infinity. So that's relatively subtle. I mean, it's very central, for example, to measure theory and probability theory, but you need this space here, C zero, which is a smaller space than L infinite. And then you need to take the space that is the dual of C zero. And uh, this space actually has a name. It's called the bounded Radon measures after Johan Radon. And so it's a subspace of the space of temperate distribution. It's actually all the temperate distribution whose sort of uh, this M norm here is finite. So you, you may wonder what, what is this M norm? So I'm, I'm telling you it's a 
is a generalization of uh, L1 because this space here is greater than L1. But now if you're in L1, it's easy because actually the M norm is the same as the uh, L1 norm. So L1 is included in M. But now the really important point that is Dirac is included in M and Dirac is not in L1. And moreover, all the Dirac's are extreme points of M. So it's exactly like little L1. So instead of the Kronecker, now we're getting the Dirac's that are being extreme points. And now we can just do a second attempt of sparse kernel expansions. So instead of L1, we put M. Then we have, you know, linear shift invariant invertible. So we have this isometry here. Everything works fine. Now, what's really nice, we can use the isometry actually to map the extreme points, which we know are Dirac's, through the inverse operator. And then we get extreme points of this guy here. And then we can actually, if this guy is linear shift invariant, L minus one is a convolution operator, and we can compute his impulse response by just taking the inverse Fourier of one over the frequency response of, of omega. And here the assumption is that this guy is well defined because <clears throat> the operator is invertible. And then you get this super nice theorem. And it's third case of representative theorem. So it means like now, Remember, the solution now is not necessarily unique, but those very special guys, which are the red points, the extreme points. And if you have all the extreme points, you do the convex hull and you get the whole solution set. Now, the theorem now says that the extreme points of our problem, they can be written as a sum of kernels. So it's almost the same equation as classical kernel method, but now there's important difference. So first of all, there are fewer kernels, because k can be much smaller, depending on how far, strong is your regularization. And the other thing is the kernels don't need to be on the data anymore. They can be anywhere. Okay, so it's adaptive. Wow, okay. And, and, and the other thing is, in fact, uh, there's a relation with sparsity somehow because the norm is just given by the L1 norm of the coefficients. And so this will sort of favor the, the solution where you have you know, many of those guys that are zero, so only few kernels, and uh, but at the right position. So, by the way, this is open-ended now because we have the, the result, but we don't know how to implement that, okay? Because the kernels can be anywhere. But we know how to implement with splines. And so here's adaptive splines. Uh, so same, uh, we just now put, uh, okay, m norm of the second derivative, and why second derivative? Because that's the right one, okay? <laughs> You'll see why. And uh, now what's uh, the problem with the second derivative, okay? It also has a non-empty null space, and now it's a null space of dimension two. It's linear plus the ramps, okay? So it uh, has two free parameters here, but it's a subspace of dimension two. And as in the previous case, now in order to be able to invert, it's invertible up to the boundary conditions, you know, null space. So you have to factor out the null space. But then, I, I mean, you can look at the impulse response of, uh, 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 you know, the inverse uh, second derivative, and that will actually be the twofold in integrator. And, you know, integrator, the impulse response is a step function. And, and so the sec sec twofold integrator is uh, integration of a step, and that's x plus. So it happens to be a ReLU function. Huh. And then, in fact, here you get your solution, which is a linear spline with few adaptive nodes. So you have your linear term here, and here only few terms here. And, <coughs> uh, uh, and in fact, those are ReLUs. And here's the solution. Okay, so that's what I, I was showing you. Now we also have an algorithm. Now the problem with this is you still have infinite solution. So we are uh, interested in finding the sparsest, which often is unique, and we have an algorithm to find it. And so if you are interested, look at this paper. Okay, comparison of in interpolators. Just to conclude the theoretical part, uh, so here's classical. Uh, uh, no, some points you want to interpolate. If you are a classical person, you will interpolate like that using sort of quadratic regularization. Now the new algorithm I just described to you what does it give you? It gives you that, okay? It will find the sparsest spline that goes through the points. 
And so here it's just one knot, and it's not so obvious because the knot is not necessarily on, on the data points. Okay, so good, but uh, I, I wanted to make a, a link with deep neural networks. And uh, now I'm claiming actually deep neural networks are very much related to splines, and I even give you a representative theorem for uh, neural network. I have to go a little fast here, but as you know, like uh, there are, uh, neural networks, I mean, there are those activation functions. In recent years, I mean, one thing that came out is that the best activation functions are reduced, and you may have noticed that those are linear splines, and they are easier to train, they give you better results. Actually, uh, people have noted that because you have those values, in fact, the whole uh, mapping of the uh, uh, neural network is continuous and piecewise linear. There's a nice paper by Strand, for example, in Sam News that uh, kind of explains that. And people have also then uh, uh, consequently uh, proposed to uh, interpret the deep really network as the archetypal splines. And, and uh, so, so that actually you can look at uh, neural networks as splines and also explains why in my first example, the output of the neural network was also a spline. Okay, let's talk a little about neural networks. So you all know neural networks, you have layers here indexed by L, uh, we have neurons indexed by N and a certain uh, widths of neurons. And what you know also, you have those, uh, uh, I mean, uh, arrows here that represent linear weights. And essentially what you have, if you go from one layer to the next, what you have here is a affine transformation. So that's the linear step. And then you have a nonlinear step inside the neurons. And uh, now the main point is we're only learning the linear steps and keeping the neuron fixed, okay? Now I'm, I'm claiming that actually this neural network implements a spline. Why? Uh, continuous piecewise linear function. Now let's start with 1D. So here's a spline in 1D. You know it is characterized by its knots like here. And, and then what you can do, you can create a partition of the domain uh, that, uh, okay, PK are the intervals between two knots. And, and, and so those domains, uh, you know, just uh, sum up to uh, the union of the domain gives you as the real line. And now what's the definition of a spline? It needs to be continuous because it, it's not so easy, actually, uh, you know, to connect uh, the segments. So the first condition is that between segments, it needs to be continuous, it's everywhere continuous. And the second condition is within every segment, it's given by a, a linear, uh, it has a linear form here. And so it's the two that give us the spine property. Of course, spline people, they rather represent it using this kind of thing as I did before, where those are review basis function. But if you have it like that, you really see uh, uh, the, uh, the piecewise linear nature. Now you can also uh, extend the concept in, in higher dimension. In that case, you will just partition your domain in convex polytopes. Uh, and you want now a function now uh, that is continuous piecewise linear with a certain partition. So it needs to be continuous everywhere. And in every one of those polytopes, it needs to be linear. Okay, and then you can show actually the only solution is, is, is things like that, that you have faces and with the pieces uh, being uh, nicely connected together. And if you have, want a vector value, uh, you, you, you have just to have uh, that your continuous piecewise uh, uh, linear for, for every component. Now, wh why is that uh, interesting? Because there's an algebra of continuous piecewise linear function. So if you add to continuous piecewise linear, it's, it's obvious you get something continuous piecewise linear. But what's much less obvious is that if you chain them, that uh, you also get something that's continuous piecewise linear. By the way, if you, uh, if you know the property of function that's conserved through composition or family of function, let me know because it, it will be super interesting. But in my view, that's the reason why this continuous piecewise linear and I, I would say spline, linear splines is very, very fundamental because it can be chained. And, and the proof is just because the uh, continuity is preserved by uh, composition and also being linear is, comp uh, is, is uh, uh, preserved by uh, composition and therefore uh, you, you can work out the details. 
And the other thing that's amazing is that if you do maximum or mi minimum of two continuous piecewise linear function like you would do in the pooling of a neural network, you'd still get something continuous piecewise linear. And so this, the implication for deep neural network is essentially that, I mean, you have this composition, but now, you know, every neuron, okay, is a ReLU, therefore it's continuous piecewise linear. Now, if you chain the, the affine part with the neurons, you get this function, which is also, it's now higher dimensional, but continuous piecewise linear. And now if you change the whole thing, I mean, you get something that's complicated, but that's still continuous piecewise linear. And it also works uh, if you have max pooling. And hence the conclusion actually that a neural network is a spline. In fact, it can only generate splines, nothing else. And now you can also do more complicated activation, not just real use. If you use a piecewise linear activation, it will still be uh, 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 generate the global spline. And so here's the idea that uh, we propose then, okay, let's be, uh, let's allow also for free form activation. We have a neural network, we're learning the linear weights, but let's also learn the neurons. Okay, now instead of having all neurons be the same, let's allow every neuron to change and try to learn everything jointly. Okay, that looks a little crazy, but I think now, you know, we can learn functions because we have all the theorems that I showed you before. And so what we need is just impose some regularization. So we should not penalize simple solution. It should allow uh, the functions to be differentiable so that we can use back propagation. It should uh, favor piecewise, uh, continuous piecewise solution. So I think you already know the solution. It's actually the M norm of the second derivative, which I call total variation two. And then in fact, we have, oops, uh, theorem for uh, deep neural networks in general. Here where we have now a composition of, you know, linear, nonlinear, et cetera. So we, we are trying to optimize a cost function. So that's your usual uh, loss function for a neural net some regularization on the weights, anything you want, like weight decay. And now the new thing, we're just adding regularization for every neuron to be learned, okay? And it's the total variation of the neuron to be learned. And now what does the theorem say? The theorem says, oh, okay, now, if the solution exists of that, then the global optimum can be achieved with an architecture where every neuron is a spline. Okay, with a certain number of knots, and uh, you know, uh, we, we, and at some position. Now, wh wh what's the catch here? It's very nice theoretically, but uh, we don't know a priori how how many uh, knots there are per neuron. So, if we regularize a lot, we, there will be very few knots. We don't know where they are. So, all those parameters are, have now to be learned from the data. But at least we have a solution that says the solution uh, the the optimal uh, learner sh should have uh, spline activations. And what's nice also, like the parameters here, we have L1 norm that gives us this total variation too. Okay, now wh wh what's the implication here? We have uh, actually, this is compatible with what's in, 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 in the literature because uh, ReLU, fits exactly the framework. So it's the simplest spline that would just have one, uh, uh, one uh, knot, but we can even push a little more, put the uh, lambda of the uh, regularization to uh, infinite, and then actually you get linear regression, which is also reassuring. Uh, there's a, a, a method that's called parametric ReLU, and, and there the idea is to on top of the ReLU add a linear term, which is in fact suggested by our theorem. And those people have shown that it improves performance. There's also earlier work where people on empirical ground have uh, proposed here uh, to use uh, uh, more ReLUs per, per neuron. Okay, so what are the advantages here? We have now a framework that allows you to adjust the complexity of the neurons and also maybe the ability to suppress layers. But now, I mean, this also uh, uh, brings new challenge because we also need algorithms to find how many knots uh, and to determine the knots. So that's 
in need of novel training algorithms. And so, so there are like lots of open issues here, how to actually make such architectures work. And so that brings me uh, to the end of the presentation. And so the conclusion, I, I, I would say it's the return of the spine. In some sense, uh, this thing of functional learning, functional optimization in Banach space. And so we have had this distinction between Hilbert spaces, which gives all the classical techniques. And now the very interesting non-convex uh, Banach spaces, which go with sparsity promoting regularization. And uh, now spline and machine learning. So in fact, the very old methods, they were inspired by splines. Now we have like compressed sensing that now suggests this new space variance uh, uh, versions, which are promising, but with, which need to be researched. Now, <clears throat> deep ReLU networks are also splines, but very high dimensional. And you can also like train the activation using functional optimization, which then gives you uh, deep splines, okay? And so that brings me to the end. I have to thank many people in my lab and they're saying here, hello to you. They're also being uh, confined a little less now so, and we're, we're hoping we will be, a will be able to get out soon and come to visit also in uh, Finland. And last thing uh, I'd like to give you here, just list of references. Uh, so there are the papers on uh, the sparse adaptive splines. And I think this one was particularly important because it really showed that splines are very universal solution, not only to learning problems, but also to the kind of linear inverse problems we have been imaging. Here's the algorithm that computes this very sparse spline that I showed you at the beginning. The representer theorem, so that's very fresh. It's just impressed now in foundation of computation mathematics. There's also like work we did for multiple kernel regression using this sparsity and uh, neural network uh, papers. Uh, <clears throat> for example, now the representer theorem that was published in the Journal of Machine Learning Research very recently. And we've also work on application of deep neural network to imaging. And maybe that's what the, uh, I get, organizers had in, in mind <clears throat> when they invited me because this work here just got uh, uh, best paper award uh, of IEEE this year and it's about uh, use of neural networks to do inverse problems in imaging but that's a, another story okay so that gets me to the end and I'd like to thank you very much and I'm ready to answer questions okay bye-bye